this year's lecture, as we've said in the past, Tisha B'Av is, um, is a day of sadness. Uh, so those of you who, I'm sorry the women weren't there, but those men who were at the morning uh, keynotes, so we spoke about the idea that uh, Chazal, Chazal understood that the, or what they wanted us to first feel on this day is sadness. Sadness of, of what we lost, meaning you can only, you can't grieve for something, you can't be mournful for something if you don't know what you're supposed to be mourning. So the first step is to feel sad. Ultimately, obviously, it's to take that sadness and hopefully it should be a catalyst, a motivating factor for change, for improvement. But the day itself is more focused on recognizing the sadness um, than per se on, honestly, inspiration, per se. So I think in that way, today's lecture certainly fits the bill. We're going to speak about a very sad event in that it involves the greatest tragedy to befall the Jewish people in their history, the Holocaust. It's going to involve a person who, I, don't, I won't say single-handedly, but I will say certainly had one of the major players in facilitating the murder of six billion Jews. And uh, it's also going to have, though at the end, since we're after Chatzos, and after Chatzos there is some sort of nechama, there is some sort of consolation, it will involve hopefully consolation as well. Let us begin. The subject for tonight, for this, this afternoon's lecture, is Adolf Eichmann, Yimach Shmo, who from now on we'll just call him Eichmann. Uh, it's interesting when some of you, my wife and I were privileged, privileged I guess, uh, to go, but uh, last year or two years ago, I don't recall, the, uh, there was a traveling exhibit and it was at the uh, Battery Park. Uh, Holocaust Museum, which is always a worthwhile place to go, they had, uh, it was a traveling exhibit on uh, the Eichmann uh, story, and uh, it's interesting, I, ha I had a, heard of an interview with the person, who the curator from Israel, it obviously came from Israel, obviously in America it was in English, but the cur they interviewed the curator from Israel, and he said in Israel, they, they just specifically only called it Eichmann. As if like, they didn't want to even give him the, the respect of like a human being with a, a first and last name. Rather, it's almost like that itself was a, a, pejorative, a pejorative title, Eichmann. They wouldn't say the first name. So, so too, we'll, we'll, we'll observe that. Eichmann is born on March 19th, 1906 in Germany. He grew up, though his family moved quickly to Austria. He was not a good student. He actually, in Austria, he actually attended the same high school in Linz, in Austria, that Adolf Hitler, Yimach Shmo attended 17 years before. He never, um, he never graduated. He had such weak marks. His father transferred him then to a uh, trade high school, we would call, I guess, in America, a vocational high school, where I think he did not graduate from there either. The, uh, he worked as he got older, uh, in 1927, at the age of 21, he was a traveling oil salesman, and uh, finally, uh, at that same year, at the age of 21, he joins the Nazi party, and in 1932, he joins the SS. The SS is uh, obviously a German word. I, I don't know what it stands for in, but you know what the SS, the, the SS, Gestapo, SD, those are, those are the evil, evil people. Not that, not that the German army was so great, but whatever, to join, by the way, just as a reference, you didn't have to 
I mean, most Germans never joined the Nazi party, just so you should know. It was a political party. Most Germans never joined the Nazi party. And even those who joined the Nazi party, obviously a, a greater minority of them ever joined the SS or the SD or the Gestapo. That was obviously the fanatics. So he was definitely a fanatic, a right-wing fascist, racist, and he joined the SS in 1932. This is still in Austria. There were branches of the Nazi party in Austria. In 1933, he returns to Germany, and there he's noted for his operational skills, his total obedience to directions and to orders, his almost obsessive obedience to carrying out orders, that he transfer him to the SD. Again, I'm not going to go into the uh, nuances, of, but they're all the same for our purposes. And uh, he, was, he was seen by one of the Nazis officials as being such a responsible and organized and a person who can facilitate and organize great events, or a lot of events, that therefore he was appointed head of the Department for Jewish Affairs. By the way, the Nazis were experts in, um, if you ever read 1984 by George Orwell, although Orwell is really speaking about the communists, but frankly, obviously, many of his concepts could reply to any uh, totalitarian state, even the, obviously the fascist state as well. And uh, honestly, even though I've read the book a number of times right now, I don't recall but the, what it was called, Newspeak or whatever. But there, for instance, the worst department, the worst department, I remember, was the Department of Love. The Department of Love was the worst department in, the, in George Orwell's 1984, that was really the department of vicious and cruel hate. So the Nazis, Yomach Shvam, were also masters at euphemisms. The Department for Jewish Affairs. Sounds like a, a, something you know, that any country would have. What a, what a wonderful thing, a special department just to specially help for the Jewish needs. However, obviously, it's just a, a a front, smoke and mirrors, of initially the Nazi plan was emigration, and that was actually Eichmann's assignment to figure out how to get the Jews out via immigration. And by the way, from the time Hitler and takes power in 1933 until September 1st, 1939, when the war breaks out, the half a million Jews who lived in Germany about 300,000 of them have sex successfully emigrated out of the country. When the war starts, there's perhaps only a quarter of a million Jews there at that point. However, uh, the Nazis soon realized that it was impossible to expect to an emigration of a large-scale emigration of Jews out of the country to different places, and therefore, ultimately, Emigration was switched to uh, was switched to extinction. And it was switched to violent and um, proactive murder, genocide. And Otto hit the Yamashmo and his entire staff, especially Eichmann, were responsible for the greatest genocide perpetrated probably in history, uh, beginning on September 1st, 1939, and concluding on May 8th, 1945. The real killing of the Jews begins in June 1941. In June 1941, Hitler, Yimach he decides we're all familiar, some of us are familiar, that shockingly so, that prior to September 1st, 1939, there's the famous Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact 
where the foreign ministers of Molotov from Russia, Ribbentrop from Germany, they engage in a, in a, in a, a pact that, of peace, that they will not attack each other and they'll remain in the same team. A shocking notwithstanding that Joe Stalin, also Yamach Shemo, was an anti-fascist as there could be, and Hitler Yamach Shmo was an anti-communist as could be, but politics makes strange bedfellows, and therefore it was beneficial to both to engage in this non, uh, any sort of aggression pact. We're all familiar with Operation Barbarossa, that in June 1941, Hitler Yamach Shmo makes the fatal mistake, which thankfully for Hashem Yisbarach, that frankly basically was the decision which cost him the entire war. Remember, by the way, by June 1941, with the exception of Great Britain, almost the entire European continent was under Nazi, was under Nazi boot by, in, by June of 1941. And uh, although his advisors pleaded with him to start Operation Barbarossa in March, February, March, April, the latest, he delayed till June 1941, and uh, ultimately, obviously, we know that the, the Stalingrad, the siege on Stalingrad, eventually, the Nazis, after making tremendous progress, eventually the Russians fought back, and uh, ultimately, we know that changed the whole course of the war eventually. But for our purposes today, when the Nazis, Yamach Shemam, broke the Ribbentrop-Molotov pact and invaded the Soviet Union, that brought uh, another two, three, I don't know exactly how the borders were, Jews under, under, their, under their belt. And now the question was, what are we going to do with these Jews? We, can, we, we can't, we have nowhere to ship them, and honestly, it does seem that initially that the head staff, Hitler, Eichmann, it does seem that perhaps, it's hard to know obviously, it does seem that Hitler actually even uh, perhaps floated the idea of actually if we can transfer them uh, to another place, there's no reason to exterminate them. I do want to add that Eichmann was against such a plan because then the master race, the master race, the master Aryan race, if you give the Jews a place of their own, they'll reproduce and they'll still be around. But it didn't matter anyway, frankly, it didn't matter anyway because the reality was uh, there was no place to send them and nobody wanted them. Therefore, as the German, as the Wehrmacht began to go east into the Soviet Union, the, in, in, as they kept going east into the Soviet Union and north, they were followed by what was called Einsatzgruppen. The Einsatzgruppen, which were divided into, there were four Einsatzgruppen, A, a B, C, and D. These groups were mobile killing centers, and um, unfortunately, I'm sure you've seen the pictures, they basically would just have the Jews dig their own graves, and then they would machine gun them, have them fall into the pits, and that would be it. Now the Nazis realized, since Poland alone, Poland alone, which had a population, Poland, of approximately 30 million people, and out of that 30 million, 3 million were Jews, which therefore they're a nice percentage of the population, and in Warsaw, in Warsaw, where most, a lot of the Jews were, the Jews were something like 15% of the population. So therefore, in a suburb of Berlin called Wannsee, W-A-N-N-S-E-E, -E, Wannsee, there was the Wannsee Conference on January 20th, 1942, where all the head, except Hitler wasn't there, but all the Himmler, uh, Heydrich, all, all the 
heads of the Nazis were there, including Eichmann. And that's when they announced that we've come to a final solution about what to do with the Jewish problem. And although historians debate, as everything is debated, however, there are some, certainly there's evidence to conclude, certainly as far as concentration camps and gas chambers and crematorias, certainly after the Wannsee conference after January 20th, 1942, there's no doubt that the Nazi genocide machine went into full gear. Now Eichmann was, import, was given the job of his job, was your, his responsibility was to gather the Jews of the lands which were conquered by the Nazis, first to centralize them in a place which they called the ghetto, facilitate their deportation to the extermination camps, and, mo and perhaps most importantly, to create the guise of, uh, of calmness among the Jews of the conquered areas in order to preclude them from any sort of resistance as the Jews were always promised that whatever is going on here is for your benefit, don't worry, we're not going to kill you, and which afterward obviously would follow their ghettoization, deportation, and actually, in all honesty, he had, at that point, he was finished with his job. He was not involved directly. He had visited a number of them, but he was not involved directly in concentration camps uh, and the gassing of the Jews. Simon Wiesenthal, the famous Nazi uh, hunter who uh, dedicated his entire life to tracking down Nazis, who we all have a debt of gratitude to. Uh, he's one of the great heroes of uh, the Jewish people after World War II. If it wasn't for him, many of us, certainly many of the non-Jews, would never have chased after Nazis or even given them a second thought. Uh, Wiesenthal, who spent a lot of his time, uh, certainly up to 1960, uh, trying to find and he was involved, he was involved with the Mossad in finding Achimin, but doing his research, background research, he couldn't find anything he was asked, he couldn't find any event. Some people trace Hitler, Yemach Shmo, had some dealings with Jews, or he saw Jews in, in Vienna, Orthodox Jews. There's really no contact that we even know of, anecdotally, or no traumatic event or drastic event that took place in Eichmann's life that caused him to be such an anti-Semite. We don't know any. The only thing I do want to suggest is that, you know, he grew up in a time, obviously, when fascism, which is so closely related to racism and totalitarianism, were not just buzzwords of the time, they were the, you know, they were the thing of the times. And remember, you had these leaders in so many of these countries, Mussolini in Italy, not just Hitler and Marx Schmo in Germany, Mussolini in Italy, you had Horthy in, in, in Hungary, and this whole idea of, uh, of Honestly, this r racism or, or the, a master race, and that therefore there has to be somebody who has to take charge, the superior people have to take charge, that he bought into very much, but I just want to point out that that also has a very euphemistic word which was going on here in the United States. It's still going on, by the way, to a certain extent, which is called eugenics. Eugenics basically is a very broad topic in science, but basically it's the belief that there are character traits, racial traits, which are passed on genetically, and when used, frankly, for a positive purpose, we, eugenics is involved in what's going on nowadays who couples who are infertile, 
and they need to have a donor egg and donor sperm, so frankly they have boutique babies because you can choose different um, traits, different DNAs, color eyes, color hair, countries they come from, to almost you know, ha create your own child. But eugenics back then was more the idea of ridding the world of people who are unfit. Probably the place which engaged in eugenics more than any other place was the good old USA. There were very, very distinguished um, scientists who were uh, involved in eugenics in this country. Just to give you one idea, uh, we all know that from 1880 to 1924, the greatest immigration of Jews in the history of the world took place, which is why some of us are here this afternoon, some of our, any of our grandparents who came from Russia, that is two to three million Jews between 1880 and 1924 found refuge in this country. Unfortunately, by 1939, the doors were shut closed. What shut those gates? The Immigration Act of 1924. The primary facilitator or the primary motivation for the passage of the Immigration Act of 1924, which limited access to the United States was eugenicists. Eugenicists involved themselves in, po in politics and convinced the enough politicians that the threat of an inferior stock from Eastern Europe would unfortunately pollute the Aryan and Anglo-Saxon wasp purest race of the United States. Another part of eugenics, by the way, was forced, forceful sterilization. Many, many states, California, many, many states, forcefully uh, would sterilize people who they believed were mentally or un, emotionally unfit. And finally, nobody less than the famous and respected Rockefeller Foundation, which supposedly sponsors humane causes which are for the benefit of the humane, human race, they actually funded eugenics programs in Germany, including the one which was attended by Josef Mengele, Yemach Shmo, the angel of death who obviously was the doctor at Auschwitz, who, which we mentioned today when the Rav Schwab in his, mentions him or refers to him in his kina, his flick of his finger to the right meant forced labor or at least life, at least temporarily, and 80% of the people was a flick to the left, which was right to the gas chamber. And frankly, there is a belief that, not a belief that's known, that, um, that, the, that the eugenics programs in the United States did inspire and did help facilitate and did help normalize the idea of the Aryan race which was being propagated by the Nazis. And therefore, it was an accepted science even in the great United States. And therefore, Eichmann, when he joined the Nazi party, and he obviously, he himself was not a physically imposing person. He was not an intellectually inclined person. He was not a particularly talented person in you know, anything that you know, would strike him you know, as something strikingly. Therefore, he found a lot of uh, validation in this uniform wearing belief and this right wing belief that we are part of the Aryan race and we're going to be protecting the world and part of that of course the preservation of the Aryan race is obviously to rid ourselves of the Jewish problem. And therefore as I mentioned ultimately 
He becomes head of the Jewish section, and he is the one who facilitated the gathering and the ultimate transferring of the Jews from their homes and their cities to the ghettos and the famous cattle car deportations to the gas chambers. I'd like to just spend a few minutes uh, understanding, understanding the, this, this monster of a human being. Although he was involved already in 1938 as being in charge of the Jewish problem, let's just focus for a moment, beginning in March, 19, March 19, 1944, ending on December 24th, 1944. Let's just focus on those few months for a moment, and Eichmann, just to get us an idea of who we are dealing with. Yes, he was involved in the deportations of Czechoslovakian, Slovakian Jews, Yugoslavian Jews, Polish Jews. However, his, uh, perhaps his most noted, in his mind, achievement, in our minds, the greatest and cruelest act of crimes against humanity and the Jewish people was his behavior or his actions in Hungary beginning in March 19, 1944. Let, let's just understand uh, uh, for a minute what was going on uh, in Hungary. Hungary was ruled by a man named Miklas Horthy, H-O-R-T-H-Y. He himself was not the strongest of rulers, not the strongest of, uh, he was also a, a fascist, but he wasn't necessarily the strongest of leaders. During the 1930s, his country, as many countries, were in economic depression, and he found that his best trading partner was the, um, was frankly, was the, uh, nobody less than the, uh, than the Germans. And therefore, honestly, he felt that he had connections with Germany. He was an anti-Semite. He himself, frankly, uh, said about himself that he's in, he was an anti-Semite. However, one thing about him, however, he, uh, he never allowed, or he totally was not cooperative with the idea of having his Jews deported. He felt that the Jews, notwithstanding the fact that they were, he wasn't a Jew lover, and he did allow anti-Jewish uh, rules to be implemented in Hungary. However, as long as he was in charge, he refused to allow uh, the deportations of the Jews, and that is why the Jews felt at least safe in Hungary. And therefore, up until March 1944, Horthy, although the Jews were being persecuted, they didn't have to wear a yellow star, but they were deprived from certain positions and certain livelihoods. But nevertheless, the Jews, the Jews who were living in Hungary felt safe because Horthy honestly felt, not such a, as a great guy, but he felt that uh, honestly, if you would deport all the Jews, his economy would fall apart totally. And therefore, it wasn't, it, therefore, sorry. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. And therefore, it wasn't to his benefit, therefore, it wasn't to his benefit to have the, uh, the Jews deported. He was something of a, of, of a, not exactly, but he was something of a puppet of Hitler and Machsmo. He never really, he never really asserted total, even though he was the regent. However, in March of 1944, he was pragmatic enough to know that the Germans were gonna lose the war. 
And therefore, in March of 1944, Horthy reached out to the United Kingdom, England, and the United States to try to make broker a separate peace with them in order to extricate his country and himself from destruction because ultimately the Russians uh, were getting closer and closer. The Eastern Front was getting closer and closer to Hungary. When Hitler got word of that, March 19th, 1944, Hitler ordered the invasion of Hungary. Horthy remained totally now a puppet. He remained in power. However, Wehrmacht troops came in, and for all, for all purposes, Germany was now ruling Hungary. And if Germany was now ruling Hungary, that meant that Eichmann was needed. At this point, there's anywhere between 700 and 800,000 Jews living in Hungary. At least 300,000 of them were refugees, or as Eichmann would call them, escapees, who had somehow escaped the Nazi net of Poland, of Lithuania, of Latvia, of Czechoslovakia, and somehow made it to Hungary. I remember in, a, uh, in the Project Witness, which is a wonderful Holocaust resa, re, uh, resource center, and they always put out a film. I remember in their film about Hungarian Jewry, it was every Hungarian Jew they, 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 they interviewed all said the same thing. They, they believed that it could not happen here. It cannot happen here. It'll be anti-Semitism, but it can, won't happen here. Once you reached Hungary, you thought you made it. You were safe now. That was what the people did. They made it to Hungary, and you'd be safe. So there were approximately seven, we don't know exactly because a lot were refugees, but between seven to 800,000 Jews. The Eichmann decided that this would be his grand finale, that this he finally had perfected to a science, the organization, the ghettoization, and the deportation of the Jews to kill every last Jew that existed. By killing all 800,000 Hungarian Jews or Jews who were in Hungary, he would have accomplished his, finally his life dream of ridding the European continent of Jews. In fact, he even said that that would be a death blow to the Jews because he said that the Jews of America, who also were ready in the, in the millions, they don't matter because they're all assimilated and secularized. And therefore, they'll never, they'll never be able to repopulate into that Jewish problem gene. It was the Jews of Europe, which he was scared about, which is why he also refused to allow emigration to Palestine. He felt that mass immigration to Palestine would allow that Jewish, terrible Jewish uh, bad blood to be, once again, have a, a be reconstituted again. And therefore, on May 15th, 1944, Eichmann believes begins his deportations. He begins them on the first day of Pesach. If you ever read the book Night by Eli Wiesel, if you haven't, you must. But Eli Wiesel was one of those people who was uh, deported, or the deportation process began on that first day of Pesach in, 19, in May 15, 1944. Basically, Hitler's, uh, Eichmann's plan, there were approximately three to 400,000 Jews in Budapest. Budapest was the capital city, and there were approximately another three to 400,000 in the surrounding regions, Transylvania, Carpathian Mountains, those surrounding areas, that's where Elie Wiesel was. 
And he figured he would take care of the, the suburbs first and leave Budapest for the end. Let's get an idea of what this, I don't know what to call it, of what, of the cruelty of this evil person, this evil thing did. Each day in June of 1944, 12,000 Hungarian Jews, each day, each day, 12,000 Hungarian Jews were gassed in Auschwitz. It comes down to 500 Jews every hour, 30 Jews every minute, and one Jew every two seconds. 12,000 Jews killed just in June of 1944. Basically, Hitler, Eichmann, and Rudolf Hess, the head of the, the commandant, they had set up new rail lines. A third rail line was set up at the entrance to Auschwitz, which led directly to the gas chambers. There are pictures. You can see the Hungarian Jews getting off the cattle cars, wearing high-heeled shoes, wearing fur coats, men wearing their hats, see them wearing see the clothing, total regular clothing, and they literally went straight. In, a, in less than 30 minutes, they were dead. They were led straight from the platform, straight to stripping. They were total, they were made to undress. They were made to go into the gas chamber. The Zyklon B pellets were dropped down into the gas chamber, and within 15 minutes, all those in the gas chamber were dead. The Nazis had an elevator system which involved uh, bringing up the corpses from the gas chambers to the crematorium, which were a floor above. And they had to re-outfit the crematoriums in order to even just deal with the amount of Jews which were being killed Daily. This could not go unnoticed. And even in a world which basically didn't care too much, didn't care too much, and frankly, although they like to say, you know, the road to Auschwitz was paved with indifference, as other writers have written, that's not really true. The road to, I to Auschwitz was really paved with collaboration. And frankly, without the collaboration, by the way, Eichmann, you should know, came into the SS that Eichmann controlled when he came into Hungary was 150 men. That was all the people he brought with him. 17,000 Hungarian members of the fascist group, the Arrow Cross, who were fanatical anti-Semites and savages, they were his collaborators without him the 150 SS people couldn't have done anything. But the world began to find out by 1944 of the mass murder. People had escaped from Auschwitz. It was known already. The famous Auschwitz report two escapees had published. It reached the desk even of President Roosevelt. And honestly, that's when the President Roosevelt, under pressure through different, mostly uh, Secretary uh, Morgenthau set up the commission to help, and that's of course what we spoke about in other years of Raoul Wallenberg, who was stationed in Budapest to help the Jews, but at that point there was pressure, international pressure from Roosevelt, from Churchill, from, believe it or not, even Pope Pius XII, whose role as the head of the Vatican has always been debated, to the extent that on July 7th, 1944, Horthy couldn't take the pressure anymore, and he ordered Eichmann to stop with the deportations. 
to stop with the deportations. And therefore, during that time period, about 300,000 Jews were killed just in that time period from May 15th to July 7th, less than two months, 56 days, 300,000 were killed. But at that point, Horthy stopped the deportation. Unfortunately, things go from bad to worse. On August 23rd, uh, August 23rd, 1944, Horthy decides that it's perhaps, at this point, it's the Russians who are banging on his eastern side, that perhaps it's time to make peace with the Russians. He realizes that the Russians, you know, there was no, there were very few, uh, there were some, but, very, you know, America, finally, the Allied forces after the war had something like close to three million POWs, German POWs. The, the Russians somehow, even though they conquered more land, had somehow very, very few, very few German POWs somehow were ever, um, were ever found in, in Russian POW camps. Because the, the Russians, frankly, did not really like to take prisoners, and this was well known, and therefore he knew that when the Russians, if they would invade Budapest, that would be it. And therefore he actually, uh, in August, he orders, he orders Eichmann to leave Hungary. He orders to, to leave Hungary. And he therefore, on October 15th, 1944, after a little bit of uh, dialogue with the Russians, he announces to his people the cessation of hostilities and the end of the war for, thankfully, for the Hungarian people. He says, at 1 p.m., he announced, on 1 p.m., October 15, 1944, this is what was broadcast on Hungarian radio. Today, it is obvious to any sober-minded person that the, Germans, that the German Reich has lost the war, announced Admiral Horthy over the radio. Quote, conscious of my historic responsibility, I have the obligation to avoid further unnecessary bloodshed. I informed the representative of the German Reich that we were about to conclude a military armistice with our previous enemies and to cease all hostilities against them. I appeal to every honest Hungarian to follow me on this path beset by sacrifices that will lead to Hungary's salvation. When that was announced on the radio at 1 p.m. across Budapest, people flooded into the streets to celebrate and Jews began to rip off their yellow stars. We were saved, we were saved, admitted one Jewish refugee at the time. We had survived. The war was over. Unfortunately, the war was far, far, far from over. Because on that same day of October 15th, 1944, on exactly that same day, Hitler and Schmoe was certainly not going to let him make a, uh, a was not going to allow that he's going to lose all these Jews and let Horthy decide what's going to be. So Hitler actually sent some of his worst and most notorious Gestapo agents to actually they kidnap. Miklas Horthy Jr., Admiral Horthy's son, and in the operation called Panzerfaust, which means armored fist. And believe it or not, they actually succeeded in kidnapping the son of, of the, the regent. And they bound him up, and they put him on a plane, and they brought him to Germany. They brought him to Germany. And 
when later that day after his announcement, all of a sudden the SS came to his office, Admiral Horthy, and they arrested him and they told him, you're now going to abdicate your throne. And he said, what are you talking about? <laughs> Get away from me. I, I'm, the, I'm the ruler here. I'm the regent. And they said, well, sign this, which shows you abdicating your throne. He said, why would I sign it? And that's when they told him that just hours before, his son is now being held in Germany. If you ever want to see your son alive, then you better abdicate. And Horthy, of course, signed over, abdicated the throne. And that was it. Soon after, he himself is arrested. And he's also brought to Germany, where he was kept under house arrest until late April 1945, when he was liberated by the Allies, and subsequently arrested by the Allies as well, but whatever. Who's taking power? At this point, beginning on October 15, 1944, at 6 p.m., the Nazi, the pro-Nazi Arrow Cross power takes over. And Eichmann Yamach Shemo returns, returns, after being thrown out in August, returns back to Budapest. And he returns on October 17, 1944. And on the, on the afternoon of October 18th, Rudolf Kastner, perhaps one day we'll speak about him too, a very worthy subject to speak about on Tishba, but not for today. He arrived for a meeting with Eichmann at the Hotel Majestic. With Eichmann. By the way, when they had to identify Eichmann, so probably the best person, best Jewish person in the world who could identify Eichmann, who had survived the war, was Rudolf Kastner. The only thing was, though, was that in 1957 he was assassinated in Israel, um, which is a whole other story. And therefore, by the time Eichmann was captured, I, Rudolf Kastner was, was dead. But the Jewish liaison to Eichmann, who met Eichmann numerous times, was Rudolf Kastner, who was a controversial figure. He had a meeting at the Hotel Majestic with Eichmann. I am back, as you see, said Eichmann, who was dressed in full uniform. My arm is long enough to reach you and you useless, dung people. They will be deported now, you hear me? Not one of those people will be spared. But this time there won't be trains. This time there won't be trucks. I'm going to march you all to death. And I don't want to hear of any of your damned excuses. I don't care anymore how old your people are or how sick they are. It's all lies. I've heard it before. There will not be a Jew left alive in all of Europe. And Eichmann, being that at this point even Hitler and refused to give him trains or even trunks to transport to Auschwitz, he began the 120 distance between Hungary and the Austrian border. He began to march, death marches death marches, beginning in October 17th, concluding in December 1944. It's difficult to know how many, the, at least probably 30,000 Jews were killed. The majority of them died in rout of starvation or of hypothermia or of being killed. However, in Budapest itself, in Budapest itself, the Arrow, the Arrow Cross, the Arrow Cross was, they themselves, almost every night, they would kill Jews and throw them into the Danube River. So therefore, between that time, which is hard to know, hard to know exactly who killed what, but about 50, additional 50,000 Budapest Jews were killed until finally December of 1944. 
hit, Eichmann didn't want to leave. By December 1944, even the biggest Nazi Himmler realized that the war was lost and the Russians were literally 50 miles outside of Budapest. Himmler ordered Eichmann to stop the deportations and to leave Hungary. Eichmann refused unless he heard it from Himmler. Himmler talked to Eichmann in a manner I would call both kindly and angrily recalled Becker an assistant. I remember one thing that Himmler said to Eichmann. He shouted at him something like this. If until now you have exterminated Jews, from now on I order you, from now on you must be a foster of Jews. And I would remind you that in 1933, it was I who set you up as the head office for the Jewish to visit. I am, you are under my command. If you are not able to do so, tell me and you will suffer the results. Nevertheless, Eichmann did delay and it was only on December 24th at night literally in the last hole in the front, he managed to escape Budapest and he left uh, Budapest at that night. The, uh, ultimately, the amount of Jews who were killed, the understanding or the assumption is that out of, again, between 700 and 800,000 Jews who were in Hungary uh, before March of 1944, by uh, January 1st, 1945, there um, were about 200,000 left, meaning approximately 500,000, or whatever it is, between 200, 250,000 were left. Some ex estimate that the total was 437,000 Jews were exterminated until finally it ended in uh, January of 1945, when the Russians finally penetrated Budapest and frankly liberated uh, whatever Jews were left. And those are the best. And by the way, compared to other countries, that's why you have so many Hungarian Jews, Williamsburg, Borough Park, many of the communities, frankly, out of other countries, that was better. I mean, much less Polish Jews survived, much less Lithuanian Jews survived. Percentage-wise, having even a quarter of a million, that was still better. But like I said, almost half a million were killed in such a short span of time. So, we, 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 you know, we have we have an idea. We have an idea of uh, of what was going on at the time, and uh, and what was what hit what Eichmann Yemachshimo was was perpetrating. Just to give you one quick example of the. Uh, of what exactly what was going on in just in general in Hungary at the time, and how the Arrow Cross facilitated without even I can, without even just the Arrow Cross being in the government. So while while Verdi's Aida played to packed audiences at the Grand Opera House in the heart of the city, grotesque characters roamed the rubble-strewn streets where posters warned that anyone called, caught helping Jews would be shot on the spot to the fetid courtyards where horse carcasses lay rotting, to the Danube embankments, where hundreds of Jews were slaughtered at dawn, their bodies dumped into the river to be washed away into oblivion. Each day now, between 50 and 60 bodies of Jews had been shot through the base of the skull, execution style. One 23-year-old Hungarian woman, Vilma Salzar, a member of the Arrow Cross, had a penchant for burning naked Jewish women with candles. Another Hungarian sociopath, Kurt Redman delighted in shooting Jews on sight. Quote, it's a pity to go through all the bother of deportations and clothing them into a ghetto, Redman had said. If we just shoot every Jew we see, the problem is over. Perhaps the most notorious figure was Father Andreas Kuhn, a Minorite monk who wore black Cossack and carried a giant crucifix and a revolver. By his own admission, Kuhn personally killed more than 500 Jews that winter until January. He would also order his mostly teenage followers to line up Jews on the back banks of the Danube, and then, as they took aim, he would cry out, in the holy name of Jesus, fire! Again, I don't want to give you the impression that every uh, member of the Catholic Christian clergy was, there were 
some who were good. Frankly, there was uh, Angelo Rota, who was the senior Vatican representative of Budapest. Uh, he was a person who was very helpful in trying to save the Jews in Budapest. In 1997, he was recognized as righteous among the Gentiles of the nations by Yad Vashem. But nevertheless, the, uh, that's what it is. From then on, Eichmann is no longer, thankfully, involved in Jews anymore. For the next three, four months, he has really left it nothing to do. April 30th, 1945, Yemach Shemai Hitler shoots himself in the head by biting on a cyanide uh, pill. And thankfully, by May 8th, 1945, Germany finally agrees to a total, unconditional, total unconditional surrender under no conditional, unconditional surrender in total. Finally, Germany agrees to that in May 8th, 1945. By the way, it, it was already May 9th in Russia, so that's why you find that out of the big four who we call participated in the war, uh, United States, England, France, and Russia, the United States, France, and England celebrate May 8th as VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. Russia, to this day, celebrates May 9th as VE Day because when they signed the armistice, it was already a different time zone. It was already May 9th in Russia. What happens now? The Americans, the British, and the Russians, the French too, they were the least decide that we're not gonna let these people who perpetrated all these crimes, especially even Eisenhower after the British and the Americans, they liberated Dachau, Bergen-Belsen, Mauthausen, the Russians liberated Auschwitz. They finally said, we're not gonna let the perpetrators of these atrocities go unpunished. And they set out a whole war crimes commission to go ahead and to arrest, hunt down the Nazis. And indeed, they, they, they did. Some of the uh, Goring, Hermann Goring, uh, was arrested. Streicher, Julius Streicher, Yemach Shmoy, the famous editor of the Stumer, and others as well. Uh, Himmler himself, when he was arrested, just bit down on a cyanide tablet, so he made things easier for everybody, a reason to feed him for a few months. And we all are familiar that in November 1945, the Nuremberg trials begin. One man, not one, more than one, but certainly one of the top five men who avoids capture uh, is Adolf Eichmann. And uh, in January of 1946, based on testimony of the defendants at the Nuremberg trial, who all basically sung like canaries and blaming everything on this guy Eichmann, they realized that he, this man, they didn't know really that much about him, that this man is a major player. So it wasn't until January 1946 that they, inter that they actually issue an international uh, warrant for his arrest. He's actually captured by the Americans that same month same month he's captured by the Americans, but there's a problem. And the problem is, is that you had between, like I said, over two million people in POW camps, and every person who was a Nazi, a member of the SS or Gestapo, had either was has dressed in civilian clothing or regular Wehrmacht uniform. Nobody proudly wore their SS uniform anymore. And how was anybody to know who we went in the Americans and the British certainly didn't even have the resources, even if they had the want, they didn't have the resources to properly interrogate. So when they asked him, what is your name? He said, my name is Otto Ekman. And they said, what are you? He said, I'm from, I was in the Wehrmacht. Where were you born? He said, Breslau. Why did he say Breslau? Because Breslau is a city which is located in the east of Germany. And at that point in the war, it was already occupied by the Russians. So therefore, even if this American 
in, in, uh, American who was, uh, who was in, interrogating him would pro try to find out in Breslau, it would be very difficult. Probably the Russians had destroyed everything there, which was that was their practice. So he, he picked a good city that he knew no one could really ever check it out. And that was it. However, finally, the, in 1946, in April, he himself realizes that he's, he, people know who he is. One of the Germans in the camp tells him, I know who you are, Herr, Herr Eichmann, and treats him with respect. And he realizes that it's just a matter of time till one prisoner looking for a favor from the Americans uh, is, going to, um, is going to rat him out. And therefore, being that he's in, I wouldn't even call it uh, minimal security. I would basically be calling it like maybe the security surrounding your, your average camp in the Catskills. It was, it was one strand of barbed wire, one strand of barbed wire surrounding this camp, which contained like 20,000 people, because this was supposedly a camp of just Wehrmacht soldiers. Uh, Eichmann decides it's not good to be here, and one day after figuring out one part of the fence, which is outside the view of the American soldiers, uh, he packs a little bag and he gingerly walks over the little piece of barbed wire and he walks to freedom. But he didn't walk just without information. Before he went, he actually had a meeting with all the former SS men who at that point he trusted them and they gave him a whole, one person said, my sister lives here, she'll help you out. Another person said, my brother uh, is, in a, is a forester in this up there near, near the German Alps. You can get a job there. And he did. He leaves and he gets out. Remember, Europe there is, is, is in a mess. The whole Europe is uh, people, refugees going left, right, who, where, what. He gets to this guy's sister. He stays there a few months. Then he realizes this is too much that's in the city. They're American soldiers. He then goes to be a forester for another six, seven, eight months. And then he says, you know, then he sees American soldiers there. That's not good. So then he actually goes near Bergen-Belsen to a small village there. He actually becomes an egg, a chicken farmer selling eggs for about a, a year with his main, believe it or not, his main customers are the Jews who are in the DP camp, which is set up in Bergen-Belsen for the displaced people most of them Jewish refugees from Nazi concentration camps. So they are the one providing Eichmann with an income. However, he realizes this is not a permanent solution. Now, also realize that, don't think like in one second, don't think, by the way, now it's not, it still exists. But certainly back then, it existed 100 times more. There was still plenty of people in Germany who believed in the Nazis. There was still plenty of Nazi sympathizers around. So, and they, frankly, set up what was called rat lines. And these rat lines were ways of getting the Nazis out of Europe. And they had contacts all over uh, in safe places. And these people, frankly, they could not have done what they done, did without the cooperation of two, uh, one is a person and a country, and the other is an institution. Uh, the institution is the Catholic Church. Without the uh, expressed uh, cooperation of the Catholic Church, there's no way that uh, Eichmann could have gotten out. And by the way, the reason was not so much, it could be some, obviously, some people in the Catholic Church were very anti-Semitic. That's true, too. But part of it was also that, honestly, you know, they were very anti-communist because communist was officially atheistic. So therefore, to help a Nazi, certainly a, a, a Nazi who believed in God was, so he, he actually gets to, uh, gets finally to a, uh, a letter from one of the Catholic priests 
he's hid in a church, and he makes his escape with the person who is singularly responsible for saving more Nazis after the war than anybody else, who's a man named Juan Perón. Juan Perón was the leader of Argentina, and Argentina became the haven for Nazi war criminals. Uh, not only did uh, Adolf Eichmann re go there, but um, also the Dr. Mengele, Josef Mengele went there, and ma many others. By the way, in all honesty, he was a very strange guy, this Juan Perón, by the way. He wasn't per se an anti-Semite. You should know that um, besides that he, he accepted more Nazi uh, Nazis than any other country after the war, he also accepted more Jewish immigrants than any other country in Latin America. And he also was the first country to um, recognize the state of Israel as it's established. And his wife, Eva Perone, was actually involved in a very great, in the beginning of the state of Israel, of, uh, involved in humanitarian actual gift to Israel of medical supplies, which was recognized by Golda Meir and Chaim Weitzman. So he's a complex figure. But he, what did he want? He wasn't such a Nazi. But what he did want, he needed smart people. And he knew many of these Germans, if the, who cares, they're cruel, they're evil. They're, a lot of them are smart. At the Wannsee meeting that I told you back on January 2nd, 1942, out of the 15 people who attended, eight of them had PhDs. And many of these Nazis, some were scientists, some were nuclear scientists, he realized that they would be, frankly, very helpful. So with the help of the Catholic Church, particularly Bishop Alois Hudal, he leaves in 1950 to Argentina. And everything is set up. July 14, 1950, Eichmann arrives in Argentina, and he's given a new name. The Red Cross, by the way, after he has this letter from the bishop, that he's a, a recognized displaced person, the Red Cross, without any investigation whatsoever, believes the letter from the bishop, from this bishop, Alois Hudal, from the Catholic Church, and without any investigation, they issue him what's called a Red Cross International Passport, which basically freed him, and he was given through this rat line um, the, an Argentinian uh, transit visa, and entrance visa, and he even got a new name, Ricardo Clement. And Ricardo Clement, formerly Adolf Eichmann, formerly Otto Eckmann, arrives in July 14, 1950, into Argentina. Now, he settles there. He never really is successful. A lot of the other Germans who were there become very big people in industrial, building up Argentina, their industry. He doesn't, he's not successful in that way. He tries a Chinese laundry, but the Chinese people who were there actually put him out of business. He tries to, again, raise chickens, but again, there are people who know how to get more eggs than he does. He's not doing well. In fact, frankly, he's a, he's a shlomil. So in June 1952, he tells, he says to his German Nazi friends, I want my wife to come. He had uh, three boys, and, uh, and they one day, even the postman in the city where they were living in Germany said, so one day in the morning, uh, Vera Eichmann and her three boys disappear, and by July 28, 1952, they too arrive in Argentina. Now by this point, at this point in time, he is an international fugitive. There are articles printed about him. He becomes almost a mystique figure. In some ways, Mengele too, but Eichmann even more so. There are sightings of him and claims that he was seen He's in Beirut. He's living on a hill in New Zealand. He's actually still living in Berlin. He actually has an apartment in Jerusalem, and he learned Hebrew and Yiddish. Yes. Everybody, nobody knew where he was. It's interesting. 
And this week's Mishpacha magazine actually has uh, the two main books, by the way. There are a lot, a lot of books on Eichmann, especially now after Israel declassified information. So a lot more people, are, a lot of books on Eichmann. This is Hunting Eichmann by uh, Neil Bascom is one of the uh, best um, books. And this is Al Alex Kershaw's The Envoy. This actually is more about Raoul Wallenberg, but he describes the Hungarian situation uh, and he has a lot on Eichmann as well. But um, in Hunting Eichmann, he points out that one, one of them, and this week's Mishpacha magazine, frankly, has the article, which is, I don't want to say, very similar to what appears here in the book. He gives some credit. He gives some credit to writer. But uh, one of the m people involved in actually hunting Eichmann is Rabbi Avram Kalmanovich, Zechat Tzadik Lebrocha, the Rosh Hashiva of the Mir on Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn, a brother-in-law of Shmuel Birnbaum, Zechat Tzadik Lebrocha, who uh, also was the, the, the Rosh Hashiva. Uh, and uh, he actually was very, he wrote many, many, many letters to the CIA, to the State Department, demanding that America take action. In fact, he actually got a letter back from them in October 1953. Dear Rabbi Kalmanovich, we are sorry to inform you that we here at the CIA are not in the business of apprehending war criminals. So um, unfortunately, he was not successful, but he was one of many. Simon Wiesenthal was very involved in trying to uh, find Eichmann Fabian Wiesenthal honestly is the first person to really know that he's in Argentina. That's because Simon Wiesenthal, who suffered through, I think, five different concentration camps, was so traumatized, we call it now P PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, is that, that he uh, went to a, a therapist in Austria where he lived his whole life uh, and how to relieve the stress and he doesn't sleep, but actually the therapist told him, take up a hobby and that'll perhaps relieve your stress. And actually he became a master a stamp collector. After his death, by the way, he didn't die so much so long ago, his, his stamps were sold at a, an auction for a very high price. And when meeting with a fellow stamp collector, I know there's a fancy word for a stamp collector, but I don't know, I forgot what it is, but whatever it is, this stamp collector actually sh showed him that one of the stamps he had, look at this nice stamp I have from Argentina, and as Wiesenthal was looking at it, and he knew who Wiesenthal was, the other stamp collector, why don't you read the letter in there? In there was a letter from a, another German ex-Nazi living in Argentina who wrote, you won't believe who I saw here on the street. Yeah, the, the master murderer himself. Eichmann, he's living here in Buenos Aires too. So I actually, uh, well, I, this is already in, in, in this December of 1953. Uh, however, he had no address, uh, even for that man, he had no address for this person, he had no connection to this person. The, the, the information was correct, but the tale, was, but the whole, it was all, the whole, the lead was cold. And therefore, on March 30th, 19. 54, Israel makes the decision not to work on Wiesenthal's advice. And um, there was something else going on now. The Korean War is breaking out. The Cold War is intensifying. And frankly, the United States and the CIA, which later on we'll see that by 1956, the CIA and the West German government, their uh, CIA, knew that Eichmann was definitely ready in Buenos Aires. Notwithstanding reports that he's in Kuwait, he's in Cairo, he's in Jerusalem, he's here and he's there, the CIA knew for sure, and so did the West German intelligence, they knew for sure by 1956 that he was in Argentina. Why didn't they share this information with the Mossad? Why didn't they do anything about it? For a very good reason. The United States was the, after Argentina, the United States was the second greatest facilitator of saving ex-Nazis. Why would the United States be involved in saving ex-Nazis? Because many of them, again, were great scientists. Many of them were extremely knowledgeable people in war. 
And frankly, the American, remember we said politics makes straight bedfellows. At this point, the American major enemy was communism. At that point in American history, we weren't sure if our grandchildren were going to be communists or you know, part of the you know, democracy, part of the United States. It was the domino theory. Communists, the Cold War, they may take over the war. We, we lost 55,000 Americans in the Vietnam War because we were so convinced that communism would take over the world. So really, Germans who were total anti-communists, it was better to have them, certainly the intelligent ones, and they killed a few people here and there. No, no. Killed a few people in there, not so bad. Better to still have them helping us in our stuff than chas v'shalom maybe being paid a bigger price by the Reds and going on to the other side. So therefore, frankly, America really didn't have any interest in finding Eichmann in the Cold War time anyway, and basically the whole trail goes cold until an amazing thing occurs. A teenage girl, a teenage girl, a teenage girl is the Chura Latov. She should remember for good. A non-Jewish teenage girl is the one who frankly is singularly has this chus and shemaim. I believe she's still alive, frankly. I think so. I think she lives in the United States, too. Who has the singular chus of really bringing Eichmann to justice. Sylvia Herman in December 1956, brings home her new boyfriend and introduces her, him, to her father, Lothar Herman, and she says, Dad, I'd like you to meet my new boyfriend. His name is Nick Eichmann. And Lothar Herman, who was a, officially a, uh, a, a half-Jew, I don't think, frankly, I'm not sure, I don't think he was halakhically Jewish, but he, um, I'm not sure but whose mother or his father, but he had certainly, he, he was Jewish enough that he ran away from Germany because he was accused of something on false charges that he was actually put in Dachau for six months and he was beaten so badly that he became blind in one eye and legally blind in the other eye. And as soon as he got out of Dachau, thankfully he made it out of Germany and settled in Argentina. And he lived among the Germans since that was his native tongue before the Nazis, before the war. He came like in 39, 40, 41, whatever. He came before the war was over. He lived among that because, and frankly, I'm not even sure he ever told anybody in German, in, 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 in Buenos Aires, that he was he didn't live in Buenos Aires, lived in a suburb, but I don't think he ever told anybody that he was half Jewish. But he hated the Nazis for good reason. They put him in a concentration camp. And when he hears the news, when he hears the news that the name of her new boyfriend is Nick Eichmann, Lothar keeps it to himself, doesn't say a word, but he has this very great suspicion that this is the son of nobody less than Adolf Eichmann. April 1957, five months later, Sylvia Herman reads the Tagblatt, the German newspaper, one out of four German newspapers published in Argentina daily, reads the paper daily to her father, her blind father, and she reads an article about the worldwide search for this mass murderer named Adolf Achmann. All of a sudden, she looks at her legally blind father and she says, Dad, maybe my boyfriend is Achmann's son. And at that point, Lothar himself says, we have to do something. So he says, Lothar, if I call the, the Argentinian authorities, they'll do nothing, because they're the biggest 
people who have given refuge to the ex-Nazis. Forget about that. If I call Interpol, Interpol doesn't deal with, uh, you know, officially uh, war crimes. He doesn't know what to do. He asks his daughter, who, 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 who anybody mentioned in that article? Anybody mentioned in that article about that you read me about Adolf Eichmann? So his daughter says, yeah, yeah, there's somebody named Fritz Bauer. He's, he's, he's a prosecutor. He's a prosecutor uh, living uh, in, in, in Frankfurt on Main. And he's, he's actually behind trying to find this guy Eichmann and other Nazis. So Lothar Herman, illegally blind, poverty-stricken man who was beaten badly by the Nazis in order to, frankly, get one thing and one thing out, get even, writes a letter in May 1957 to Fritz Bauer. Bauer is Jewish. Bauer is a brilliant man. Without Bauer, also Zohur Latoyev, who died childless, never had any, unfortunately, bonim, may bonim. Bauer, he's a Yid, he was one of the brilliant minds in Germany, already in the early 30s. He became a, a judge in the early 30s. And then when Hitler came to power and the Nazis put in the Nuremberg Laws, he found himself without a job. So he escaped to Denmark. But then the Nazis invaded Denmark. So he escaped to Sweden. And he remained in Sweden throughout the war, writing a newspaper against the Nazis with the eventually German Prime Minister Willy Brandt. And after the war, after serious consideration, he decided the only place he can go back to is Germany. Why? Because now I want to get even. And since now it's a democratic country, he gets his job back as a prosecutor, and he's known as a tough prosecutor, particularly against ex-Nazis. And the, he gets this letter, and he writes immediately back, immediately back to Lothar Herman and says, can you please provide, I need more information. How do you know maybe Nick Eichmann is Eichmann's son, but maybe Eichmann is still speaking Yiddish in Jerusalem, and just his wife and kids are, are, are there. How do you know that's his son? Did you, didn't, did you ever meet him? So he said, no, so I need more information. June 1957, Sylvia and her father, dating a long time, Sylvia and her father go to the Eichmann house and they knock on the door and Mrs. Eichmann answers, Vera, his wife, and she says, she says is Nick here? Oh, Nick's not here. But being a proper German, she says, uh, would you know, she knew this is his girlfriend, do you like to sit down for a cup of coffee? And she said, yeah, I would. That, that'd be nice. And all of a sudden, a, uh, a man, approximately 54 years old, walks into the room. Now, she looks at this man, and she realizes that the age is perfect. She realizes that certainly looks like the daddy in the house. So when he says, he speaks to her in German, of course, how do you do? And he, she says, fine. And she says, are you the father of, of Nick? And she noticed the man is startled. He doesn't answer. Finally, he stumbles and he says, uh, oh, I'm his uncle, his, his uncle. Okay. Five minutes later, who comes? Nick himself. Nick comes in and he says, what are you doing here, Sylvia? Who said you could come? So 
she said, is there something wrong with my, my visiting you? Is, is, what, what do you mean? What's wrong with visiting you? How'd you know my address? He secretly never gave her, her, her his address. Now, during that time they were dating, he often bragged to her of how her father, his father, was one of the greatest facilitators of the final solution. And he often bragged to her how his father was a, a Nazi a hero and how proud he was of his father for exterminating so many Jews during the war. He himself was a, a neo-Nazi, I don't know. He himself was certainly anti-Semitic. So here's this man, but he says his uncle. So of course he never gave her an address because he had to, he didn't want her to come. So, but she's there. So she says, any problems? And Nick, of course, no, no problems, fine. And she schmoozes a bissel, drinks her coffee, and then she said, okay, I have to leave now. My father's with me. I have my father and I came here to also for some other reason. So the man, the uncle, does the proper German thing, and he escorts her to the door. And as he escorts her to the door, Nick, of course, follows to escort his girlfriend out. As they leave the house, Nick turns around and says, thanks, Dad. Thank you so much, Dad. And a few minutes later, she says, if that's your uncle, why, why do you call him father? And Nick, again, his face turning color, says, oh, oh I, I, he's, he's my uncle, but sometimes I call him that out of, out of respect. And therefore, Bauer says to, therefore, Lothar Herman writes back, we have found Adolf Eichmann. This is what he looks like. This is, what he is. this is where he lives. He gives an address. This is, he has three kids. He had a fourth kid by that. They had one kid, another, Ricardo in Argentina was, was born about 1955, I think. And this is where he lives. Everything's great. Fritz Bauer, by the way, Germany and Israel, you don't have diplomatic relations at this point. 1957, Bauer meets with Felix Scheiner, who's head of the Israeli representation to West Germany, and he tells him the only people on the face of the earth that can bring him to justice is the Mossad. If I tell the West German government, they won't do anything. Because the West German government, by the way, uh, Glopko, one of the heads of state there in the Adenauer government, was an ex-Nazi. There were many ex-Nazi who were very good uh, bureaucrats, and he knew the West German government wasn't interested anymore in dealing with Nazis. America wasn't interested in Nazis. Interpol wasn't. The only, and it, certainly Argentina wasn't. The only chance he had. He relays the information in January 1958, Isser Harel sends a Mossad agent to Buenos Aires to 4261 Chacabuco Street in Buenos Aires to identify Eichmann. He keeps walking down Chacabuco Street, long time, 4261. It starts with mansions, beautiful homes, swimming pools. All of a sudden, the neighborhood starts to change, become slummier. There's a lot of swastikas graffitied on walls. And finally, he comes to a rundown, like shed, a dump. Now, you have to realize, in the minds of the world, in the minds of the world, this man, Eichmann, was, they thought of like, you know, they knew the facilitator of the Holocaust and how many millions, if not billions of dollars did they pillage from the Jews? They, this man, Eichmann, this man who controlled the operating system of the entire final solution, everybody in the world, certainly the Israelis, imagined him living in a palace with servants and maids, and which find, by the way, that's exactly how Yamach Shmo Yosef Mengele did live. Many of the ex-Nazis did actually live like that. 
became very successful and extremely, a lot of it from pillaged money. Problem was that Eichmann killed Jews lishma, not lo lishma. He did it only lishma for killing Jews, and therefore he never bothered taking any of the money. And he kicked himself, why didn't I, I could have taken so much money from the Jews. But this Mossad agent was so convinced that it can't be that Adolf Eichmann lives in this dump. So he goes back to Isser Harel, and Isser Harel, his, he, he reports back to him, this guy is a faker, this guy is Lothar Herman, he can't be. And Lothar Herman says, I, I, I'll bring you more proof. Unfortunately, Lothar Herman goes and finds out through the, uh, whatever, the local city clerk that the house is owned by a man named Francisco Schmidt. And Lothar Herman makes a mistake by saying that this guy, Francisco Schmidt, who they see must be really, must be really uh, an alias for Adolf Eichmann. And even though he has a scar on his face with Adolf Eichmann never had, it must have been he had plastic surgery. However, when Isser Harel looks into that, he finds that this guy, Francisco Schmidt, is no way Adolf Eichmann. He, he came already in 1945 to, to Argentina. Everybody, there were sightings of Eichmann in Germany still in 1946, it can't be. Plus, this guy, Lothar Herman, is very interested in what's with the reward, what's with the reward. There's a reward I should get. So Isser Harel says, you know, I, I forget this blind guy. Forget about it. That's May 1958. October 1959. Tuvia Friedman, who is the Israeli version of Simon Wiesenthal, also a Nazi hunter, gets secret information that Eichmann is living in Kuwait, living it up Kuwait in a great oil baron in Kuwait, and he has this on certain information. And he, he calls the Mossad and they say, Tovia, enough with you, enough with you, Tovia, with your Mishagas and this. He was also in the camps and this, and, and he, he, he was involved in killing Nazis. Some wars, maybe they weren't. After the war, whatever, you're part of these people, revenge groups. So he says, Tuvia Friedman says, I can't, I, I, I can't live with myself. So he goes to the local pay phone. He, of course, in 1959, he didn't have a home in, you know, hardly anybody had a phone in their home in Israel. He had to wait five years. He puts in Asimon in the, in the phone, and he calls his friend at Mariv, largest Israeli daily. And he tells him, I have airtight information that Eichmann is hiding in Kuwait. And he's very convincing, very compelling, very detailed. And therefore, the next day, in early October 1959, after Mariv publishes the story, it goes viral. And picked up by United Press, Amer Associated Press, all over the world, the story goes up that in Germany, America, Adolf Eichmann is in Kuwait, let's get him. He gets a lot of mail, a lot of mail to Tovia Friedman. One of the letters he gets on October 24th, 19, 1950, is from a man named Lothar Herman in Argentina, who tells Tovia Friedman, you got the wrong place, right man, but the wrong place. He lives right next to me. He lives here in Argentina. I'm telling people before. I'm telling you, he's in Argentina. Tuvia Friedman, again, tries to inform the Mossad about this, because this guy's letter sounds very convincing. He provides details, etc. Again, the Mossad says, we've done this day, we, we've done this dance once, but then something changes major and that's December 1959. To this day, we don't know who it is. Probably the people involved are all dead at this point. 
but most probably an ex-Nazi who's about to be prosecuted by Fritz Bauer, spills the beans and tells Fritz Bauer the one piece of information that nobody knew at this point, that there is a man named Ricardo Clement, again, who lives at 4261 Chukabuco Street, who is Adolf Eichmann. And all the information this, this informant supplies is so on target and so matches exactly what Lothar Herman was saying that Fritz Bauer, who again is so l'shem shamayim, a mamash a tzaddik of the yid, he gets on a plane and he goes to Israel this time himself and he demands a meeting with Chaim Cohen, the, who is the attorney general, the minister of, of the legal representative, he doesn't want Harel anymore. He doesn't like Harel, the head of the Mossad, and that he thinks he's, uh, he's not good. And Harel takes, attends this meeting, and he comes into this meeting screaming. He says, do you want this man or not? Ricardo Clemente have his name at the same address that Loth Herman, two different people from, who never knew each other, who have no contact with each other, who are in two different places in the world, what exactly is the possibility of this? Your man is here. You sent some guy for two weeks because he lived in a slum? With the information I'm giving you, the grocer on the corner can catch him. Since this is, Harel is being ranked out in front of this uh, minister, and Harel himself realizes that it, Harel says, no, the game has changed. And on December 6, 1959, just days after Bauer's visit, Ben-Gurion tells Harel, bring him back, alive or dead. Bring him back, but preferably alive. I want him to stand trial here in Yerushalayim. Tzvi Haroni, March 1, 1960, arrives in Buenos Aires. He was the first to discover when he looks for the water bill on 4261 Chukabalco Street that it's registered in the name of Ricardo Clement, exactly the same name that Bauer su supplied him with. Now he's convinced that this is Eichmann. He quickly goes to 4261 Chukabalco Street there's one problem. There are workers there painting and working and doing woodwork and painting and adding and building. And he goes, uh, who lives here? And they go, oh, they haven't moved in yet. Oh, where are the people who, who lived here? You mean the German family? Uh, yeah, yeah, the German family. Oh, oh, you want them? Yeah. Oh, they, they moved out two weeks ago. Where did they move to? I don't know. How should I know? I don't know. I don't know where, where I moved to. Now. So he says to himself, Aharoni, oh my gosh, it's a country of 22 million. He's moved. I'll never find him now. I'll never find him now. And they have, is, I don't know if it still does. Maybe they do. I don't know. But Israel used to have these people called Sayarim. The Sayarim were sort of like guides, especially after the Holocaust. They were unpaid people who were more than happy to help out the Mossad, the Israeli Mossad in certain places in the world. You help a Yid. Like they were sort of like Chaveirim we have here. They were Chaveirim, really Chaveirim. I mean, they, 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 and they knew never to say anything. So, and they had them all over. So, Tzvi Aharoni speaks no Spanish. He meets with a Sayar, Juan, and he says to Juan, um, you know, um, can you go ahead, Juan, and go back to the building and, 
and see, talk to them in Spanish, see, you know, maybe you can get something out of them. So he talks to him, he talks to him, and they feel bad for this guy, Juan. Local guy, I really need this family. But finally, one of the workers there said, you know, you look like a nice guy, I'll be honest with you. I know where they live. Because I'm doing work also on their home. They're just building a new home. And you know, that German, he still owes me money. So, I, and I sometimes go to work there. I'll, I'll tell you where it is. It's on Garibaldi Street. Take bus 202, two stops here, get off, make a right, 100 yards. There's only two houses on the whole block. Go to Garibaldi Street, you'll see it. Wow. And by the way, you should know, since you're asking, his, his son, you know, the guy you're looking for, his son, you know, works, uh, you know, works in this, the garage on the corner here, on the corner. Really? Yeah, yeah. So Juan comes out, and he goes down, he calls in the garage, and he gives an idea, is, is Nick Clement here, is Nick Clement here? And happened to be the two brothers work there, another son, Dieter. And the brother Dieter comes and says, and there's only one is there. And he said, who, who do you want? Oh, I want, I, I want, uh, I want Nick Clement. I said, you know, I, I heard he used to live here. What, 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 you know him? Well, I have a, something to give him. I said, well, I understand if you know him, why are you calling him Clement? My brother's name is Eichmann. Not Clement. Oh, so Juan reports back to Aroni and he comes back so sad. His face is forlorn. And he said, I have such bad news to tell you. Remember, he's a Sayar, he's not to know anything. You, know, you told me to get you know, more about Clement and, and where he lives. I have to tell you the truth. We got the wrong name. The name of the family that lived here is not Clement, it's Eichmann. I'm so sorry. So Aroni, they were eating lunch, almost swallowed his fork. But he says, oh, oh, oh okay, you know, that's fine. That, you know, that's fine. By the way, don't ever tell anybody what we spoke about today. And goodbye. Thank you. You know, you, you've been a great sayah. And now for sure, they know. To make 100% sure, is that the Mossad goes to the registry of homes, which you can do here, I guess, in America, too. When you buy a home, I guess the deed is on file. It's public information. And again, they send the Sayar to do it. And the Sayar comes back and says, I don't know. It's under, look here, read it. It's under somebody, Vera, Deich, Vera Deichmann. That's not the name you told me. It's not the name you told me. And again, Aharoni says, oh, 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 Vera, you know, oh, no, Vera Feichman. Vera Feichman? Uh, oh, it's okay, thank you. He realized immediately that either it's an E misspelled or an E written improperly. His wife is Vera. Now there's proof Harel is still in Israel. And he sends back the message the carrot is red. The carrot is red was the official information that Eildorf Eichmann has been 100% identified. They undergo daily surveillance through March and April. They have a hidden camera. They take pictures of Eichmann. Those pictures are sent to Israel. And even though the people who identify him haven't seen him in 15 years, They're pretty sure that that's the man. And at this point, Harel says, we're going, to, we're going to capture him. And Harel decides this time, I'm gonna be there too. And 10 come, by the way, Harel, there's two, like in America, I think the FBI and the CIA, I'm not sure, but I think the FBI does internal stuff, like in country stuff, and CIA does out of the country stuff. So Israel is something called the Shin Bet, which is, uh, does in the country stuff. And then they have something called the Mossad, which does out of the country stuff. 
1960, the head of the whole thing was this guy Harel, Isser Harel. Mm -hmm. He owned everything. <laughs> he was head of both. So he gathered together both Shin Bet and, and uh, 10 of the best Shin, uh, combined force of Shin Bet and Mossad agents. And just one person we'll quickly name is Peter Malkin. Some of these people, by the way, eventually raid later on in the 90s. If they wrote books on this. Peter Malkin, who's uh, him, they emigrated to Eretz Israel in 1935, him, his mother, and his father, and his brother. However, his sister, who was older and married with three children, she said, don't worry, we'll come, we'll come. Eventually, she was gassed in Auschwitz, courtesy of Eichmann and company, and three children. And, um, and he was a giant of a man. Powerful person. Rafi Eitan, an Israeli born kibbutznik, a master, a master spy, a master spy and a master coordinator, can see a situation as a whole in a minute and quickly figure out exactly what has to be done to manipulate the situation. He's appointed head of the team, the ground team. Everybody arrives in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, in different time. Different places, different countries. Some go via Europe, well, everyone goes via Europe. Some go from Germany, some go from this country, some go from France. Different times, different places. And they arrive in Argentina. Now the question is, when we get him, what do we do with him? There are no flights from Argentina to Israel. There are no airlines that fly from Argentina to Israel, none. You'd have to go to two different airlines, go via Europe, and El Al, at that point, never flew to Argentina. Here's where Hashem Yisbarach shows us, again, his chesed. Argentina was celebrating in May of 1960, its 150th anniversary of its freedom from Spain, of it becoming a free country. 1960, the 150th anniversary of the statehood of Argentina. And they invited all delegations from all countries that they had dealings with, they had relations with, to come and celebrate with them. And one of the countries they invited was Israel. Now, at that point, I don't know anymore, I doubt, but at that point, El Al worked closely with Isser Harel. It was a much smaller country there. You have to realize that, uh, um, you know, by the way, just that if you don't know, El Al actually racked, had, was, now it's a private company, but it used to be owned by the government. Well, everything was owned by the government when it was a socialist country, but it was owned by the government. El Al actually came into being when they had to get Chaim Weitzman after the state was declared he was outside the country to, uh, I think it was in Europe somewhere, to Israel, and they couldn't, they wanted him, if the president of the country, if the future president, it's Pasnish, that he, maybe you don't have Air Force One, but he's not gonna fly El Al, not gonna fly in Israel, but they had no Israeli, so they, they took actually a, a, an old army plane that they had, and they put a few seats in it, and they painted a blue and white flag on the, on the tail, and wrote, let's call it El Al, up, up, up we go, and that's how El Al was formed. That was the first, quote unquote, civilian flight of El Al, and then the company cut. So Harel worked with a lot of people from El Al when they had their missions. Harel approaches El Al and says, listen, I want you to bring the delegation to Argentina. He says, why? There are reasons. Why? <laughs> there are reasons. Finally, he meets with the CEO of, of El Al, and he confides in him, because you're going to be bringing back on your return trip, Adolf Eichmann. And again, the, you know, the, the pilot and the CEO, they almost faint. You know, could they imagine that what could be, I mean, a gunfight at the airport and this, and obviously they have to handpick the crew of who's going to be there. You can have somebody bring this mass murderer on board. 
But of course they agree. And on May 11th, 1960, the first El Al flight, it's not direct, it's made three stops. It had a stop in uh, different places till it finally, you know, went over Africa, then in uh, South America, until it finally gets to Argentina. And they arrive with the Israeli delegation. Immediately, immediately then, Harel says, May 10th, that's when we have to do it. That's when we have to do it. May 10th comes, actually May 9th comes, and Harel, they're doing the last, last part of the operation. They're figuring out how they're gonna catch him in this, and Harel is on his way to Garibaldi Street, where all of a sudden, there's a car accident in front of him. And there are people wounded, people injured. So I guess, I don't know, you know, Buenos Aires in 1960 wasn't like, I don't know, maybe it still is. But all of a sudden, he's, a policeman stops him and says, hospital. He says, what? Hospital. And he opens up his back door and he throws in an injured guy and he said, hospital. I guess they didn't have too many ambulances, and whoever was there at the car at the crash site, that was your job to take the guy to the hospital. So Isser Harel became a, a hospital ambulance driver, which um, unfortunately they lost a day, and therefore they pushed it off to May 11th, 1960. There had been there was surveillance over him for two weeks straight. They knew exactly every move he made. They knew that he got off a bus every to bus 202 at 7.40 p.m. He always walked to a small kiosk to buy a pack of cigarettes. He then made a left and he would walk down Garibaldi, walk on the highway off 202 until he reached Garibaldi Street, where he'd make a ride onto Garibaldi with his house, with only a couple of houses there, and he would go right into his house the house had no running water and no electricity. He would, write, he would light a couple of kerosene lamps when he came home, and every night was exactly the same routine. 740 bus, could buy cigarettes, walk down 202 to Garibaldi. Here's the plan. The plan is there'll be a car, and the car is gonna have its hood open. And there's going to be two men, two men. Peter Malkin is going to be one. Zev Tabor is going to be the other one, also a very powerful man. And Rafi Eitan, the leader, will be in the back seat. Malkin, who's going to be the capture man, is going to say, as he passes by, Eichmann will have to pass by the car. As he passes by, he's going to say, Un momento, senor. And as Eichmann looks up, he's going to grab him by the neck. And the plan was that within 12 seconds, he was a strong man, Malkin, and he had practiced hundreds of times, that he'll be, lift him off the ground and put him in the back of the car. That's the plan. The morning of May 11th arrives, a day later. Malkin goes to a shop to buy gloves. When they ask him why he's buying gloves, he said, because I don't want my hands, I don't want my flesh to touch that monster, to touch that, the skin of the person who killed my sister and my nephews and my brother-in-law. 740 arrives. Bus passes by. Nobody, nobody, nobody uh, gets off. 7.50. Bus stops. A woman gets off. Should we call off the plan? Remember, we, we said we'd only wait 15 minutes. It's now 7.55. Ad Eitan says, Let's wait till 8 o'clock, a little bit. They wait, 
Finally, at 8.05, they see the lights of a bus approaching. And a frail, skinny man gets out of the bus, goes into the kiosk, buys a pack of cigarettes, and starts walking in the direction of Garibaldi Street. Peter Malkin picks up his binoculars and whispers to the crew, here he comes. 100 yards, 50 yards, 10 yards, 5 yards. He's right there. He's right there at that point. And then he says, and then he says, he steps out and he says, un momento. And Eichmann steps back. And Malkin lurches forward, grabs him by the neck. And as he's falling back, and, Eich and Paul Malkin's pushing forward, unfortunately, they both go down together. And Eichmann lets out an animal guttural scream of an animal, of a savage, that's finally cornered. Quickly, Zev Tabor and Rafi Eitan, Rafi Eitan leaps from the car. Zev Tabor is right there. They grab his legs. Malkin quickly gets up holding his torso. The back door is open. They throw him into the car. Tie first frisk him that he no has any weapons. They bound his feet and his hands. They put him on, this, on the floor, put a gut huge woolen blanket over him. He closed the car and Rafi Eitan screams to Aharoni, the driver lets go. 21 seconds have elapsed. The second car, the backup car, in a few minutes pulls up to the car and Zev Aharoni gives the thumbs up. And then the message, Harel is not yet informed, but for the first time in history, a mass murderer is going to have to answer to the Jewish state for crimes against the Jews. Malkin tells him in fluent German, don't move and don't say a word or I'll kill you. Do you understand? No answer. Don't move or don't say a word or I'll kill you. Do you understand? Again, no answer. They're wondering, have they, have they hit him too hard? Is he alive? And finally then, in perfect German, they hear from under the Blanket, my fate is sealed. All is lost. At that point, the men congratulate each other as they realize they've captured Adolf Eichmann. They bring him back to a safe house. They check him, check his teeth, his false teeth, make sure he has no cyanide capsules. In a matter of five, 10 minutes, Peter Malkin, who's the chief interrogator, asks him for his SS number, his Nazi number, what name were you given at birth? And without hesitation, my name is Otto Adolf Eichmann. And he's chained to the bed. And for the next nine days, he's interrogated, he wears goggles that he can't see, happened to be the cook, the one who's cooking all the food, happens to be a from Jew, so he's eating only kosher. They have to feed him because they won't let him, he's kosher. And finally, on the day before, on the day of that their plane is about to return, the only problem they're worried about is that legally are they kidnapping. They prepare a letter that they ask him to write that I am, being, I am going to Israel on my own free will. 
I understand that I will be given a chance to have legal representation. I am not being forced to go. I recognize the fact that I'm going to be tried and I'm doing it totally consensually. And after they gave Adolf Eichmann a, a drink of wine and they told him he'll be wearing a nice El Al uniform, Eichmann decides, as his fate is sealed, he signs the document, which is the final step. He's brought to the plane, he's sedated, he arrives at the plane, and they ask, well, what's happening? The you know, Argentine authorities, well, what's with this man? They say, oh, he had a little too much to drink, you know how it is. <laughs> they, let, they let him, they don't ask too many questions. They put him on the plane. At that point on the plane, he's handcuffed again, placed under a blanket. And at 12.05 a.m., May 21st, 1960, the El Al plane takes off from Argentina with Adolf Eichmann on board. At 7.10 a.m., March 22nd, the plan led, led safely at Lode Airport near Tel Aviv. On May 23rd, he's brought before Judge Emmanuel Halevi to issue the official arrest warrant. He asked him, what's your name? And he said, my name is Adolf Eichmann. You are charged with the crime of genocide. Fritz Bauer is called in Germany. He begins to literally leap for joy. And that afternoon, that afternoon, on May 23rd, 1960, May 23rd, 1960, Ben-Gurion, Ben-Gurion goes to the Knesset in a very, very understated way and says the following. I have to inform the Knesset that a short time ago, one of the greatest of the Nazi war criminals, Adolf Eichmann, who was responsible together with the Nazi leaders for what they called the final solution of the Jewish question, that is the extermination of six million of the Jews of Europe, was discovered by the Israeli security services. Adolf Eichmann is already under arrest in Israel and will be shortly be placed on trial in Israel under the terms of the law for the trial of Nazis and their collaborators. The place was silent. Nobody knew what to do, what to say. Adolf Eichmann, honestly, amazingly, was brought to Israel. He would be interrogated at that point from May until, the official, until going till almost next April. He wouldn't be tried. He's interrogated for nine, ten months. And on April 11th, the trial begins. Amazingly so, the three judges who are going to try him, Moshe Landau, Binyamin Halevi, and Yitzchak Raveh, are all born and educated in Germany. Anytime Eichmann spoke, there was no need for the translator who was simultaneously translating into Hebrew. If they spoke the mother tongue. The Attorney General, the prosecutor, Gideon Hausner, although he was a Galiziana from Poland, he also spoke fluent German. He also had a German background. He was masterful. He caught, Eichmann himself took the stand. Eichmann never showed remorse. Eichmann never admitted his guilt. Eichmann never took responsibility. The Gideon Hausner called 113 witnesses who emotionally described the terror, the cruelty, the torture they endured because of this evil man. And frankly, 
He made mince meat of Eichmann, catching him in lies left and right, in contradictions, in misstatements, in contradictory statements, in outright lies. It didn't matter because when you kill six million people, what's a few lies when you're on the witness stand anyway? Eichmann presented himself as some sort of low bureaucrat, as if he was a pencil pusher, not responsible, not decision maker, totally unaccountable. He was just a, a lackey following out orders without any sort of accountability or any sort of responsibility presented himself as a nobody. What do you want from me? I'm a nebuch. The reality, he was a cold-blooded, calculated, manipulating facilitator of the greatest genocide in our history. He was a rabid, Jew-hating, evil, satanic incarnate. who with the efficiency of a, of a weld oil machine guaranteed that any Jew that would come near him would never leave alive. But he presented himself on the witness stand as some sort of pathetic nobody, which probably in reality he was. August 14th, 1961, the trial ends. December 15th, 1961, the three judges reach, reach their decision. They tell Eichmann, of the 15 counts against you, we find you guilty. We sentence you to death by hanging. Eichmann shows no remorse. They ask him, do you understand the verdict? He says, I understand the verdict but by the laws of this court, I am not guilty of any crime. He, by the way, Israel allowed two German lawyers, two German lawyers, to be flown in from Germany to um, represent Eichmann, to make, give him fair representation. They also allowed, by the way, his, his wife to come a number of times to visit him. March 1962, Eichmann appeals the verdict. The appeals court of five judges turns down his appeal. May 29, 1962, Eichmann appeals in his last appeal to Yitzchak ben Svi, the president of Israel, who has the power to pardon him. And he says the following, I haven't sinned. I did nothing wrong. I am clear even with God. I am not guilty of these crimes. I ask you to grant me clemency as I deserve. Two years ago, Israel released the telegram. I, I have it. Not here, but I have it. Got a copy of it, obviously. They released the telegram that Vera Eichmann sent from Germany, where, in German, of course, where she begs Ben Svi not to leave her and Almona and not to leave her four sons, Yisoyman. And Ben Svi, we have his handwriting. I saw it, it's online. Amazing, a Jewish president. What did he write on her telegram? He didn't have to answer anything, obviously, but what did he write on the bottom of her telegram? He wrote, Vayomer Shmuel, Kasher Shiklon Nashim Charbecha, Kain Tishkal Min Nashim Imecha, Vayishasef Shmuel es Agag Lifnei Hashem Bagilgal. As your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Shmuel killed, decapitated Agag. Then Svi denied the 
clemency plea on June 1st, 1962, at 12.15 a.m. Eichmann Yemach was brought from his cell, walked 50 yards past the other cell, cell blocks, and brought to a gallows. Nobody before and nobody after has ever been executed in Israel. There's a special gallows built for this occasion. They tied his hands, his feet, his knees. They placed a noose around his neck. And he refused, he refused the black hood usually given to a, a hanged man. He shouted out his last words in front of four journalists, a couple of, obviously, the executioners or whoever was the representative of the government. And he screamed out, long live Germany, long live Argentina, long live Austria. These are the three countries which I have been most connected and which I will not forget. I greet my wife, my family, and my friends. I am ready. We will meet again soon, as is the fate of all men. I die believing in God. At that point, before the signal was given to hit the switch that the trap door below him would be released, he noticed Rafi Eitan smiling as justice was about to be done. And Eichmann said in a low voice, which is really the last words he ever said in his life, he looked at Eitan and he said, your time will come to follow me, you Jew. And Eitan smiled and looked at him, but not today, Adolf. Not today. It's amazing that Eichmann, Imach Shmoy, was 56 years old and 74 days old when he was executed. As if Niba v'lo yadama Niba, he prophesied, but he didn't know what he prophesied. When Rafi Eitan said those words, not today, not today, Rafi Eitan would live 58 more years, more than the years that Eichmann had lived at that time. He just died last year at the age of 92, having had an illustrious and very productive life, counterterrorism, and politics, and a successful businessman. At six o'clock, right after the execution, Eichmann was taken out, and at one o'clock in the morning, a Holocaust survivor was given the deschus, limched zecher amolek, to light the crematorium. And when the crematorium was hot enough, they picked up Eichmann's body and threw it in the crematorium until nothing remained of this evil thing except ashes. At six o'clock in the morning, the ashes were put on an Israeli police boat, left the coast of Tel Aviv, and sailed until it was out of Israel territorial waters. The cursed ashes were dumped in the sea. That should be no zecher of this cruel and evil man. Hannah Arendt wrote in the closing of her book about Eichmann, and just as you, Eichmann, supported and carried out a policy of not wanting to share the earth with the Jewish people, and the people of another, 
num people of a number of other nations, as though you and your superiors had any right to determine who should and who should not inhabit this world, we find and come to the conclusion that no one, that is no member of the human race, can be expected to want to share the earth with you. For this reason, you must hang. I'm just going to end off. We've ended. And first of all, the story itself is a Tishabov story. Obviously, one Eichmann doesn't come close to six million Jews. But a Nechama, a small Nechama, a slight Nechama, Hashem did give us. That justice was carried out. That in this world there is justice. Yes, there still is the concept, there still is the concept that perfidy of theodicy, that tzaddik veralo verosha vitovlo, why do the good suffer, it still exists. The theodicy riddle still exists. But nevertheless, when Hashem shows us a glimpse of justice, that a mass evil murderer is faced and is put to justice and is given the punishment he deserves. That just brings us to a sense, kel nekomos Hashem, kel nekomos hofia. Hashem, the God of vengeance, reveal yourself. And that, that is something that frankly, does bring about a sense, a sense of awareness of Hashem's hand in this world. In a world which is so full of Hester Punim, to be able to, if you realize how many things could have went wrong, how a Gentile girl who was dating a boastful Gentile son of an anti-Semite, how his brother is insulted that Juan, the Israeli, the Jewish Sayar, doesn't know that his brother's name is not Clement, but Eichmann. If the water meter was never properly checked that it's under Ricardo Clement, if Franz Bauer, that German, who was trying to somehow facilitate uh, an easy sentence, wouldn't have given that information up. For almost 10 days, Eichmann remained hidden in Argentina. So many things could have went wrong. Thankfully, that time, everything went right. And that's something we have to be makir to Hashem. I also want to say the collateral benefits to the trial were multiple. This was really the first time in history that the world, that the world saw, that the world saw the Holocaust on display. It was the first time that there was a, a, a total recognition, total recognition of, of what the Nazis had done, and what the, the extent of how they did it. And frankly, even in Israel, even in Israel, it was a time that the Israeli youth, so many of the Israeli youth who had no, they looked out, frankly, at the Holocaust people as sheep to the slaughter. They realized just how terrible things were. And for one brief moment in history, the nations of the world realized that indeed, the Jews were right. The Jews were right. It was a, ba a major Kiddush Hashem. How he was tried. And all across the world, with obviously few exceptions, but even the Soviet Union, 
applauded Israel for the successful sentencing and execution of this mass murderer. Like I said, since then, Holocaust awareness, Holocaust awareness and awareness of anti-Semitism, frankly, which is so important to us, has grown and frankly is, is something which even in the non-Jewish sector, hopefully, is something which is taught. We conclude with just remembering as we do the words of the Nitziv, as Hannah Aaron said correctly, that if you choose that I'm not worthy to live with you, then you know what? You're really not worthy of living in anyone. We remember the words of the Nitziv when he recounts that the Bayes Sheni, the second temple, was destroyed from Sinis Chinam. He writes, during the second temple, there were tzaddikim and there were chassidim, as well as those who toiled in the words of Torah. However, they were not yesharim. They were not straight and honest in their dealing with others. Due to baseless hatred in their hearts towards each other, they suspected those Jews who disagreed with them on religious matters were either Sadducees or heretics, apikorsim. This brought them to bloodshed, shvichas domim, under false pretenses and many other evils until finally Hashem destroyed the Beis Amigdash. And this is the praise of the Avos, that besides their being chasidim and lovers of Hashem in the most perfect way, they were Yesharim. That is, they conducted themselves towards others, even towards idol worshippers with love. They cared about providing for the benefit and to keep the world in existence. Bezos Hashem, in this case we should learn how not to act. In this story we learn if a person can be so evil and destroy the lives of so many, we have to realize how a person can be so righteous and frankly rebuild the lives of so many. May this be the last Tisha B'Av lecture we have to give the help of Hashem next year, Shana Haba, Yerushalayim.